Um, rolling it back just another week. We're going to get started here momentarily. In just about a minute. We'll talk about that in depth, and then we'll answer any remaining questions at the end. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hit the record button here, and we're going to go ahead and get started, and here we go. Welcome, everyone, to the National Fair Tax Webinar. Again, my name is Mark Maneri, and I'm joined by my co-host, Larry Walters, who's a Fair Tax District Director here in Central Florida. Uh, and I, I've been an advocate of the fair tax now for, gosh, probably about five years, and I was introduced to it by my colleague, Larry Walters, who is with us, and he's been at it longer than I and is just an incredible wealth of knowledge when it comes to the fair tax and an amazing resource. So I'm happy to have him here with me. And we're going to give everyone a general overview of the fair tax uh, to start with. And then we will take a break. We will answer questions. And then we'll go through our special topic, which is a real valuable and important one tonight, uh, as it always is. And then we'll finish up with questions as well. So with that, let's get rolling here. So when we talk about the fair tax, we describe it as simple, fair, and the screen that you're looking at right now suggests that the current federal tax law is over 72,000 pages. Actually, I believe it's eclipsed 75,000 pages now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and the fair tax uh, is just so simple. And so, you know, I always like to say that our country is great because we evolve in so many ways. Well, our income tax code is one way that we have not evolved, and it's really holding us back economically. So we've got to evolve. We've got to go to a more simple system, and the way to do that is, of course, oops, excuse me, is the fair tax. Now, the fair tax is legislation that exists right now in our Congress. Uh, the bill is known as H.R. 25 in the House and S13 in the Senate. Uh, by the way, you can go to fairtax.org, the main fair tax website, and you can download the actual legislation. And you should do that because it's really enlightening, and it's only 131 pages double-spaced. Now, you can you compare 131 pages to over 75,000 pages, uh, and the, the difference is just amazing. And uh, one of the things that my colleague Larry pointed out to me is that since 1986, the Internal Revenue Code has been adjusted over 16,000 times. So we've got to get to a, a more simpler platform that is going to allow our country and the individuals and the businesses, more importantly, within it to really thrive and to be rewarded uh, for growth and expansion. So we'll get to that and talk more about that in just a minute. So what is the fair tax? In its most simple explanation, the fair tax is a new way to fund our federal government. And understand when I say that, it ta when I say that, I mean revenue. It's a new way to generate revenue that is more stable than what we have right now through the income tax income tax system, it does not address spending. All right, It does not address spending. Now, talking about how to rein in Congress's uh, unprecedented spending powers, the fair tax will actually uh, bring some, some benefits and value to that process. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just uh, a little bit later in the presentation. But ultimately, the fair tax is about raising revenue in a new uh, and more stable and predictable way and to do it in a way that encourages economic growth and expansion rather than penalize it. So what will the fair tax do? We will completely eliminate the personal and corporate income taxes. We'll get rid of all payroll taxes, estate and gift taxes, capital gains taxes, and all the other taxes that you see on the screen here. And it will be re replaced with one standard federal national retail sales tax. So what that means is every time you purchase a new good or a service for the very first time, 
the fair tax will be levied to the tune of 23 cents out of every dollar spent. And that is inclusive. Now, what do I mean by that? That means when you spend a dollar on a good at the cash register, you don't pay $1.23. The fair tax is built into the price tag when you check out for something in the checkout line or when you purchase a service for that matter. All right? So it's inclusive. I'll go through another example of that in just a little bit. Uh, now, also notice that the fair tax is not levied on business-to-business -business transactions and also not on used goods. And this is really, really important to know because uh, a lot of opponents of the fair tax, or not even opponents, um, demagoguers of the fair tax who use the fair tax as a way to slam their political counterpart on the other side of the aisle uh, will suggest that the fair tax really hurts low-income uh, earners in America. And that's just not true. It is not true, uh, number one, because the moment we eliminate the personal income tax, the average American's income is going to go up by 29%. And let me say that again, the average American's income will go up at least by 29%, plus people can choose to purchase used goods and get some marginal savings there, right? So a used home that's been lived in, a used car, used clothing, et cetera, et cetera, All right? So there's a number of ways that lower income class Americans benefit, as do all Americans, financially from the fair tax. All right. Now, let's talk about our current pricing system, and we'll dig a little bit deeper into some of the uh, points that I just shared. So right now, the, the, the truth is there's double taxation happening for consumers. So you and I, we pay our personal income taxes. Well, we also pay a sales tax in the form of business income taxes that get passed off to the consumer. So how does that work? Well, Every business uh, thinks of their business income taxes and their costs associated with complying to the federal income tax code as a line item expense in their business. So let's say uh, you've got a company that's selling a $100 widget, right? Um, and they want to profit 20%. They want to profit $20 every time they sell that widget. Well, that would mean that in, in, in this scenario, they have eighty dollars in cost. Well, one of the line items that is it creates that eighty dollars in cost is their corporate income taxes or their business income taxes, as well as their cost to comply to the income tax code, which might be hiring an expensive accounting firm to do their taxes. So that is built into the price of that hundred dollar widget when when I go to purchase that at the cash register, and in effect, I'm paying for it. All right. And so we, we call that the embedded tax, and across all industries, it's approximately 22% uh, of retail goods and services. And so what will happen is when the fair tax gets passed, uh, that embedded tax or cost to businesses will come out. So approximately 22% of cost comes out, and the fair tax of 23% goes in. And so what happens is you have a relative wash. Now, it's not going to be uh, completely smooth, meaning uh, prices are going to rise marginally, but it's really important to understand that prices are not going to go up by 23%. No, they're not going to go up by 23% because the embedded cost or tax of 22% comes out, meaning the corporate income tax goes away, payroll tax goes away, cost to comply to the income tax code goes away. That 22% comes out, the fair tax of 23% goes in, prices are going to rise marginally somewhere in that 5 to 10% range, and then natural market forces of competition will bring it back down over a couple of years back to pre-fair tax levels. So think about this. Um, think about Think about a, a good way to, to understand uh, this example is thinking about a home builder. 
So imagine a home builder is a business and they've got all kinds of inputs and business materials that go into building a home. So whenever they purchase lumber and bricks and copper wiring and drywall and tile and et cetera, et cetera, all the things that go into building a home, the fair tax is not levied when they have to purchase those raw materials from other suppliers. That's a business to business transaction. Um, now, when they get that house finished and they sell it to the consumer for, uh, let's just say for simplicity purposes, $100,000, the fair tax is included in that. The consumer pays the fair tax uh, and the business is responsible for setting aside 23%, in this case $23,000, and will send that to their state sales tax bureau every month, uh, who will then pass it on to the Department of the Treasury. Now, when the consumer who purchases that home brand new goes to resell it to another consumer, no fair tax is levied, right, because it's considered a used home. So that's a general or generic example of how the fair tax would work from a retailer down to the consumer who pays it, the business sets it aside, sends it off to the government, and then when the consumer resells that home, the fair tax will never be levied again on that property transaction. All right, so we've talked about simplicity with the fair tax. Uh, we eliminate virtually all the taxing um, mechanisms that the federal government is using today to raise revenue and we replace them all with one simple national retail sales tax. So very, very simple. Well, now we want to talk about fairness. So with fairness, uh, the creators of the fair tax created an element of the legislation called the prebate. And the prebate assures that no one, regardless of their income level, will pay federal tax up to the poverty level. Now let me share with you a little bit more on what this means. So what you're looking at here is the prebate schedule. Now, independent of the fair tax legislation, the federal government's Department of Health and Human Services have put together this annual consumption allowance uh, poverty level limit spending depending on the size of your household. And so there, there's a formula that goes into that, and that's for another special topic on how they calculate that. But what you want to do is look at your family size and, and move your eyeballs down to, let's say, an example, and, and this case is a married family with two kids, so a total of four. Well, the Department of Health and Human Services has suggested that over the course of a year, uh, that family will spend $29,420 minimally to, to just sustain the basic necessities of life uh, to meet poverty level limit spending. All right? And then anything over that, of course, um, is above the poverty level limit. But at $29,420, they will have spent uh, to, to sustain the basic necessities of life, food, shelter, clothing, transportation, and medical supplies. Now, if we multiply that 29,420 times the 23 percent fair tax that would be levied on that spending, you'd get $6,700 roughly. And then if you divide that by 12, then every single month, on average, that family would be spending $564 in fair tax, uh, in taxation on their spending. And so what the prebate does is it reimburses them that $564 every single month at the beginning of the month in advance. And that's partly why they call it the prebate, right? So what you're seeing here is fairness created in that the fair tax legislation will reimburse all households regardless of income, whether you're making a million bucks a year or, you know, only... $20,000 a year. Uh, if you're a qualifying household, meaning you have a valid Social Security number, 
you would receive that $564 every single month. So here's another reason why uh, the fair tax benefits lower income class Americans. So not only do they keep 100% of their paycheck, not only can they purchase used goods, but they can also are going to receive a brand new revenue stream every month into their household, reimbursing them upfront for the, the monies that they're going to spend in taxation on the basic necessities of life up to the poverty level limit. Right? So that's a prebate is a very, very important element of the fair tax that creates fairness. Now, what are the main benefits of the fair tax? Well, we talked about one in that the average American income is going to go up by 29%. More on that in a second, I'll circle back. The next bullet point you see here on the screen is that $11 trillion in offshore wealth uh, is estimated to be sitting in offshore banking centers. These are wealthy individuals and corporations that are parking their money in accounts that are free from taxation, such as Cayman Island account. And the moment the fair tax gets passed and income taxes at the personal and corporate level go away and capital gains taxes go away, that money is start to flow back into our economy. It's estimated that a trillion dollars of it will flow back in. Why? Because wealthy people will have access to that money without uh, it being penalized and taxed and captured by Uncle Sam. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to use that money to do it and invest in what they know best, which is their businesses. So they'll start to expand their businesses, build more infrastructure, hire more people, more jobs will be had, people will make more money, they'll have more disposable income than ever before because of that uh, no more personal income tax withholdings. And as a result of having more disposable income than ever before, guess what most Americans are going to do with it? They're going to spend it because that's what we do in this capitalistic society, in this instant gratification society where we have lots of choices to have the best, the best cars, the best clothing, the best restaurant experiences and hotel experiences. We're going to go out and spend it. And as we do that, it's going to absolutely skyrocket this economy. All right. Second bullet point, U.S. becomes a corporate headquarter haven. We'll have the lowest effective income tax, corporate income tax rate in the world, zero. And corporations will flock here to receive those benefits. And they will build infrastructure. And they will hire people. And it will create jobs. Uh, and that is a brilliant stimulus right there. And then the last one, the underground economy, which is estimated at a trillion dollars, they will pay their fair share. And that's what helps to um, make the fair tax a revenue neutral alternative to the current income tax code. Revenue neutral meaning uh, in the year that we pass the fair tax, the federal government will, will receive the same amount of money and raise the same amount of revenue for the government than they do right now through the IRS and the income tax code. Right? So those are the main benefits. You know, there's lots of other benefits, uh, but in its most simple form, what you've got here is a system that rather than penalizes expansion and growth in savings, in investments, it supports it. So in our current income tax system, when we make more money, the government takes more. When we have better performing investments, the government takes more. Uh, so that doesn't inspire the behavior of wanting to save and invest and grow and expand and make more money. No. It, it wants us to hoard. So uh, the fair tax will really prop up the economy by rewarding and inspiring more growth and more expansion and more sound investing. So uh, very, very exciting um, what this will do to our economy. And for every American individual, because at the end of the day, it's not just what it's going to do for our country, 
It's what is it going to do for you and me? And at the end of the day, it's going to put more money in our pockets, and which is going to give us more opportunities. All right. Now, how is this fair tax going to get collected? Well, the good news is the infrastructure is in place. 45 states currently collect a state sales tax. And so we'll leverage that existing infrastructure to collect the fair tax. So what will happen is, and I mentioned a little bit earlier, is every single business will be responsible for setting aside 23% of their gross receipts. And then every month they'll literally fill out one form that suggests here's what their gross sales are, multiplied by 23%. And they'll be responsible for setting that number, that amount of dollars, into their state sales tax bureau. And that state sales tax bureau will send it off to the Department of the Treasury. Now look at the second bullet point. We instantly get 80% more efficient because we, we, we now are collecting from about 18 to 20 million businesses rather than 120 million households. So that's a, that's a huge point right there. Only one form to fill out. And the state bureaus that are responsible for collecting and policing uh, will be funded by keeping 0.25% of all the revenue that they collect from all the businesses in their state. All right? So that's how it's going to work. And basically, from a transition standpoint, uh, let's say we pass the fair tax this year, there would be a one-year uh, transition meaning in 2013 we'd still operate under the income tax code and then on January 1st of 2014 the fair tax would go into effect and as of that day we would no longer have to pay any income taxes and every single month uh, every business would be responsible for remitting their 23 percent to their state sales tax bureau that's how it would work so if you think about all that we've talked about here thus far um, we've talked about simple, we've talked about fair with the prebate, uh, we're going to get to transparency in, in the special topic here. Uh, there's going to be massive transparency. Uh, no longer can politicians hide behind um, you know, this convoluted 75,000 page income tax code. Um, you got to think who in their right mind wouldn't want this when it's benefits every American when it benefits businesses and it benefits the government because as the economy expands um, they're going to generate more revenue. Well you're looking at it. Lobbyists, politicians and some IRS workers for the most part. Those are the folks whose income is really derived from the current tax code. Um, and I'm going to talk about politicians in just a minute uh, but it behooves them to keep the system that we have now, as sad as that is. Um, and again, I want to save that for the special topic, but obviously lobbyists are threatened. 50% of lobbyists in Washington are tax lobbyists. And so they get paid handsomely six and seven figures to lobby Wall, uh, excuse me, Washington the politicians and Congress to alter the income tax code in favor of the wealthy corporation that they represent. And by the way, they're extremely successful. For every dollar that a corporation pays a lobbyist to change the income tax code in their favor, it returns $6 in corporate income tax savings. Crazy. And so what you've got is now these lobbyists who are saying to politicians, Oh, you don't, you don't want to go tinkering with any massive changes in the income tax code uh, because it's not good for you. Uh, and by the way, we're not going to dump, uh, you know, a million bucks in your re-election campaign if you do that because this really serves us right now. Right? And so you've got lobbyists putting money in politician re-election campaigns uh, and, and stifling economic growth just so politicians can get re-elected. And that's literally what happens. So we've got to get away from that. We've got to hold our elected officials accountable to representing their districts uh, in their district best interest, not their own selfish self-interest in re-election campaigns. All right? All right, so more to talk about here, but we want to uh, first let you know that 
this is a wonderful book. There's a couple of fair tax books out. This is the second one that came out by uh, Neil Bortz and John Linder, who is one of the who is the original co-sponsor of the fair tax bill in Congress. Um, so we want you to get educated. We want you to buy this book. Go to Amazon.com and buy it for nine or ten bucks, and it's a wonderful Christmas gift. And we also recommend you purchasing a few copies and sending it to uh, the chairperson of the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, your local congressperson in your district and the senators uh, in your state as well. All right, so what we want to do here is just pause and we want to tackle a bunch of questions that have come in. And I'm going to ask my colleague Larry to take himself off mute so he can help answer the questions. And we're going to go ahead and take some questions right now and then we'll go to the special topic and talk more. Um, about the fair tax. All right. So uh, the first question is from Tony, uh, and he asked a real good one. It's a great one to get started, uh, and I'll and I'll tackle this to start, Larry, and then I'll I'll ask you to chime in as well. So Tony says, I've been a fair tax supporter for about five years now, and have been trying to introduce it to many other people. My problem is I'm having trouble getting people to get excited. Anything you can suggest would be very much appreciated. Great. Thanks for that question, Tony. Uh, it, it's a great question and an important one because that's exactly how the fair tax is really going to come to fruition. It's going to be a grassroots effort. It's going to be enough voters in each district across the country uh, that uh, make waves and, uh, and get their elected official to say, wow, I, I really got to pay attention to this. So. How can we do that? Well, uh, one of the things that we've been really successful doing at here in Florida, Tony, is every time there's a major public event, uh, whether it's a festival of some sort or a concert or um, you know anything public in that capacity, we set up a table and chairs in a booth, um, and we are out there waving signs, and we've got greeters in front of that booth, and we're moving people into the booth and, and telling them to get educated, uh, and just and just asking if we can have them into their time, and that's been really really successful. We just give them a quick overview, and then we ask them to sign a petition, um, and that's been a, a huge huge success for us. But when you're talking individually, uh, one of the things that I've liked to say to uh, my friends is, I'll ask them if are they familiar with the fair tax and if they say no I'll say well let me ask you a question how would you like it if you didn't have to pay taxes anymore or actually more accurately I say how would you like it if you didn't have to pay income taxes anymore and of course people look at me kind of strange Tony and they say well how the heck are we going to do that and I'll say well we're going to do that through the fair tax and how would you like to keep a hundred percent of your paycheck rather than having to give up twenty thirty percent or more to the government and so that tends to get people excited, and that's a really good lead-in for me, and then I'll give them an overview, and, and anybody who, who, who I've been in front of that has gotten an overview, they're all over it. All right? So that's just a couple of ways that I'm personally successful as well as our groups here in Central Florida, uh, and I'll also invite Larry to share some ideas as well. Go ahead, Larry. Sure enough, Mark. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, Tony, one of the things that I like to do is ask a person, what kind of work do you do? What I am really probing for here is, are they employed in a company working for somebody, or do they have their own business? Depending on which scenario they fall into, it depend on the answer or my next question. But if they work for themselves, then I would ask them, well, what would it do to your business if you no longer had to deal with the paperwork and the filing of a federal income tax return? Mm -hmm. And that you could, you could keep all of your all of your proceeds, and you would only pay tax on goods that you use or that you consume personally. That's usually enough to get them thinking and, and start conversation with them. <clears throat> but the, the real point is you, we have to remember that everybody has their own personal interest, and it is up to us to try and determine what that interest is. Talking about keeping their whole paycheck, whether they're employed by somebody else or uh, they have their own business, is one way of finding out what's interest of interest to them 
and then addressing that and letting them ask the next question. Uh, the more questions we can get them to ask, the more we're talking about what is of direct interest to them and the more chances we have of getting them excited about the fair tax. The fair tax is really, like Mark mentioned, a very simple concept. There are some nuances that people don't understand, but that's what our education is there for. That's why Mark and I have been doing these webinars for four years now. Mark? Yeah, thank you, Larry. And I love that point, by the way. Uh, it really triggered something for me because I'm, I'm self-employed. And so it's a great question to ask is what you do, especially for self-employed people. Um, I, I mean, I, I would be open to being worse off financially if I didn't have to go through um, the headache and the hassle and, and the exhaustion of filling out and going through the whole, you know, tax process and, and, um, and having that all done. And it's just such a headache. And, and the amount of time and energy that goes into tax-related decisions you know, if I, if I aggregate that over the course of the year, it's hours and hours and hours, and I'd rather invest that time somewhere else. But, you know, obviously the fair tax is going to put me and, and all self-employed small business owners in a better position financially. But that's another point, Tony, uh, just saying, you know, you'll never have to do that ever again. You'll never have to file your taxes um, as an individual ever again. And, and I think that alone will, will turn some heads, too. All right. Um, John, John Vettel is with us. Uh, John, he's been on before. He's a great supporter of the Fair Tax. Good to have you, John. And John says or asks, can we show critics who say that the embedded tax is far, who say that the embedded tax is far lower than 22 uh, percent, any study or evidence that validates our assertion that the actual number is indeed an average of 22 percent? So if you're new to the fair tax, again, what John is referring to is the, what we call the embedded tax. And I referenced that early on in the presentation. Um, and that is the cost to comply to the federal income tax code plus corporate income taxes equate to approximately 22% on average across all vertical industries. Uh, as cost that goes into the price of their goods, right? Uh, and so John is suggesting that critics are saying uh, the embedded tax isn't really that much. So how do we combat that? You know, that's a good question, John. I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to ask Larry to see if there's any evidence either on the fairtax.org site or, or anything that he knows of that would, uh, would be helpful in that capacity. Larry? Yeah, sure, Mark. There was uh, part of the research that was done by the uh, economics professors that led to the fair tax found that there is between 20 and 25 percent embedded costs, embedded taxes in everything that we purchase today. There is a chart that reflects that and it reflects it in a way that has created some confusion so we typically don't talk about it. Uh, one of the papers that are on the website, on the Fairtax website, uh, that's fairtax.org, uh, has that chart in it. And I don't remember exactly what that paper is, but I'll tell you what. If you will send me an email, I have got a copy of that chart on my uh, computer, and I will email it back to you. Uh, the point is, however, is we've got $20 million of research that went into creating the fair tax as we know it today. We, we have to accept the fact that these professors, these experts in their field, knew what they were doing, and we've got this research that they provided to support it. If somebody is going to argue that it's less than that, the only real recourse we have is to challenge them. Well, we've got this reason. We, we can tell them we've got $20 million of research that found there's 20 to 25 percent of embedded costs, depending on the industry. What research do you have that shows that it is less? And then let them justify their point. Put them back on the defensive. Mark? Yeah, really good, Larry. Thank you. Uh, by the way, John pointed out, as when I went over the book, that um, there's used, that are like brand new books, uh, fair text books available on Amazon for just three to four bucks each. So thank you, John. That's brilliant. Okay, so uh, let's go through some more questions here, and, that's, and then we'll hit our special topic. And there's a bunch more to go through. I'm not going to get to them all in, in the next 
a couple of minutes. We'll go through a couple more, and then we'll take them all at the end after the special topic. Okay, so Michael asks a question. He's familiar with the issues, the embedded taxes, etc. Michael wants to know who or what entity has the funds to advertise the fair tax on every receipt of every major retailer, Walmart, Home Depot, supermarket chains, etc. The fairtax.org needs to purchase a small ad on all receipts, perhaps with a coupon code or a point system to get people aware of the fair tax every day on every purchase. That, that's a, it's a very interesting idea, Michael. You know, what, what's, what, I, what I certainly agree with is that the fair tax needs a corporate sponsor that is willing to stick their neck out, uh, and that's part of the issue. Um, a wealthy individual or corporation that are willing to stick their necks out um, and really put some big time dollars behind this effort because that's uh, there's there's no question that's going to be a piece of this is money right you want you know tens of millions of people to know about this well we gotta we gotta bombard the media um, in a lot of unique ways so we do need money um, and to my knowledge we ha we haven't gotten that uh, deep pocket donor yet, whether that's an individual or corporation. And it's understandable, you know, from one point of view why a corporation doesn't do it because it might seem political even though it's uh, a nonpartisan issue and it benefits corporations. Um, but I am surprised at this point that we don't have um, a wealthy individual who hasn't stepped up with, I don't know, a hundred million dollars and said, we got to do this. So I guess it's connections and who you know, but um, anyway, that's my commentary at this point. Anything else, Larry, you would add to that? No, Mark, except I do have one uh, negative or one criticism about that particular idea. If we were to put on a sales receipt, for example, just uh, some comment about the fair tax, it would not be enough information to make the people uh, understand what it is we're talking about. And, it could, and it, it's, all it's doing is opening a door to something that ha doesn't have any support at the moment. I'm not talking about the fair tax itself. I'm talking about the idea of the fair tax on the receipt. Uh, what is the fair tax? Why is that on this receipt? It, it creates more questions. You know, it might be a good idea now that I'm talking about it out loud, thinking about it out loud. Uh, I would get people asking the question, what the heck is the fair tax? Uh, I'll retract my criticism on that. It might be a good idea after all. Thank you. Mark. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Um, all right, let's take this question and then uh, and then we'll do our special topic and then we'll come back. There's at least a dozen more questions, so stay with us, everyone. All right, uh, Ken Kenneth asks a question: What entity or new bureaucracy uh, will take care of processing the prebate? Some of the opponents who I have spoken to feel that we would still have an unpopular government bureaucracy with the fair tax. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Larry, but it suggested that the Social Security Administration will execute the prebate every single month since they're the ones already processing Social Security checks uh, monthly. Is that accurate? That is correct. They've got the infrastructure already to do that. They will need to uh, add some more computing power and a few more people, but the actual processing will be done by the Social Security Administration. On another note about the Social Security Administration, as far as federal, federal reporting goes, the only federal reporting that any business will have to do is to advise the Social Security Administration once a year what your gross income was, what the gross payments are that they made to their employees, so that when it comes time to calculate benefits, the Social Security Administration has the income-related re numbers they need to do that. Mark? Great. Perfect. Thank you. All right, great questions, everyone. Keep them coming. Uh, we're going to spend about 10 minutes or more reviewing this special topic, and we'll come back and answer the rest of your questions. So we, Larry and I talked about this, and we've done a lot of special topics. Uh, obviously, we've been doing this for just over four years now. A lot of nuances of the fair tax that we get into a little bit deeper. We thought it was really important, especially in light of uh, so much tax reform conversation happening uh, during this presidential election uh, and that we expect to happen over next year 
there's going to be some income tax reform. Uh, well, we don't want to put band-aids on the current income tax system. We need a new system. And so it's really important to understand and buy into this because we can't vote for and support um, congressmen and women who support putting band-aids on the current income tax system. It's broken. It's broken beyond repair. We all know that. We need a new system. And the fair tax is that system. So we can't be voting for, well, uh, maybe a flat rate over here or a little bit lower here but a little bit higher there because the current income tax system, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it, it picks winners and losers and, it, and there's no way around that. Right? The fair tax is just simple and fair for everyone across the board. So let's look at it a little bit deeper. Okay, so one of the reasons why we, again, don't want to just fix the current system or try to uh, have some revised version of income tax system is because it's inherently complex. And we talked about that earlier in the presentation with this over 75,000 pages in our current income tax code. Um, but if you think about it, uh, I guess I did mention this earlier. Um, oh no, this is a new one. In 1914, when the income tax return was first established, it was three pages, but the instructions were only one page. It was simple. Well now, because of the evolution of our income tax code to 75,000 pages, it now takes 43 pages just to, just to instruct somebody on how to fill out their income tax form. All right? Obviously convoluted and extremely complex. And it can only keep going that way as you um, put a patch to close a loophole and then you put another patch on that opens up another loophole and you keep putting patches on patches on patches and every time you do that, you make it more complex and more convoluted. So we've got to get away from that. All right, the other reason, the next reason I should say, uh, is that tax on businesses are passed to consumers every time um, there's an income tax. The key point here is that consumers get double taxed. And so under the fair tax, all consumers are going to go out and ultimately every time we spend money uh, on a new good or service, we're going to pay our fair share. But that's it. Right now, what happens is we pay the income tax, and then we also, in effect, we pay a sales tax uh, in the form of the prices of all the goods and services that we buy right now. So right now, we're really paying both, right? So uh, we're getting double taxed right now, if you think about it, uh, and obviously that's not fair, and that penalizes uh, growth uh, as opposed to stimulating and supporting uh, expansion. All right, number three, it adds massive compliance costs to businesses. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier, and I, I'm, I'm a one-man shop with my business. I'm a consultant. I have compliance costs. <laughs> I have I, I pay um, an accountant um, and also an advisor on tax-related decisions. Think about well, you know, massive corporations. They have a, they have whole departments and, and entire staffs uh, that are a part of their organization that they have to pay and pay a handsome sum, uh, sum of money just to get to be familiar with the complying to the federal income tax code. And not only that, uh, you think about major corporations. Um, the the the, the amount of time and wasted brain energy that goes into tax-related business decisions is huge. And if all that time and energy could be reinvested into making our products and services better and becoming making our businesses more competitive, well, obviously it would push our economy forward. So, again, the income tax is stifling for that reason as well. All right. Now, if we look at it this way, an income tax is exactly what Karl Marx prescribed in his Communist Manifesto. Uh, and this is pretty wild. 
uh, if I just scroll forward to the next slide, you'll see uh, the second plank of the Communist Manifesto is a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. And I'm actually going to invite my colleague Larry uh, to share a little bit more on this point, which is pretty revealing. Okay, Mark, your slide uh, did not advance. No, you're not seeing that? No. I'm still seeing the first uh, page. Why we don't have... There you go. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is only the first five boards, if you will, planks of the Communist Manifesto. But if you see plank number two, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax, what is it that we have been living under for, well, I was going to say 99 years because that's how long it's been in force, but I don't think any of us on this uh, webinar are 99 years old. So that, that, is, that said, we've all been living under this progressive graduated income tax all of our professional lives, all of our working lives, and we have had the opportunity to see how it is a, a hindrance to us advancing whether it's just in our personal, personal life as an employee or whether we're a business owner. And so why, the question is, why would we want to continue with a tax system that was designed by Karl Marx with the specific intent of being able to convert a free nation to a communist nation? And that's exactly what the Communist Manifesto is. It's the 10 planks to transition a, a free country to a communist country. Why do we want to do that? I don't know. And in my opinion, we don't. And in my opinion, we would like to do everything in our power to avoid that. So that's where we are. That's the point we're at right now. With Congress going to be talking about tax reform, we want to avoid them implementing some other form of income tax. And every flat tax proposal that's being offered are taxes on income. They all require the 16th Amendment. And that's why we want to abolish the 16th Amendment so that income can no longer be taxed. Mark? Yep. Thank you, Larry. All right. Let's keep moving. The next point is that uh, the income tax punishes individual hard work. And you see there it says the bracket creep. So what does that mean? Very simple. When you work harder and you make more money, you run the risk of moving your personal income into a graduated increased income tax bracket and you get penalized for working hard and making more money. Uh, and so that's, again, you've heard me say it throughout this entire presentation, we need a system, uh, a, a, a tax system, a revenue generating system for the government that incentivizes growth and hard work rather than penalize it, which is exactly what uh, an income tax system does. All right. Uh, and and the, you've, again, you've heard me say this throughout the presentation, it also discourages investment growth through capital gains taxes, right? So you, if you invest and you do well, the moment you want to cash out of that investment, um, you get penalized for it. You get penalized for the risk taking um, and for uh, the growth in whatever that investment was. So and then in quotes there, unless, or excuse me, parentheses, unless special loopholes are provided. So here we go. Uh, there's all kinds of loopholes that are saturated, are saturating the current income tax code. And that's a big part of why we've got these 75,000 pages and making it so complex. And the moment you institute loopholes, again, you've got winners and losers, right? So. Uh, we got to move past that and make it a very simple system for everyone. All right. Next, it gives Congress unintended special powers. And I think for me, this is one of the most eye-opening and crucial points about why we don't want any form of the income tax. And so think about this. Um, right now, Congress, when they want to institute uh, something for their district or something for themselves, for that matter, um, when they put forth some sort of legislation that is uh, out of self-interest, 
they got a way to find a way to pay for that, right? So how do they do that? They pull some hidden lever, meaning they manipulate some of the 75,000 pages in our current income tax code to find some hidden way that has no transparency uh, to pay for whatever it is that they want to create. And we, the consumers, we, the people, we never know about it. And so what's happened is the income tax code has given Congress enormous powers that they were never intended to have. They control the purse strings and they manipulate those purse strings in ways that the average citizen never knows about. And that's never how this system was set up or designed to be. So think about this. Why is an income tax desired by our Congress? Because they sell themselves a special interest. Tax loopholes for campaign contributions. We talked about that. They force social behaviors through tax regulations. And of course, they control businesses favoring some while punishing others. And you know, you think about tax lobbyists, 50% of tax lobbyists who are getting and manipulating uh, or getting Congress to manipulate corporate income tax code. Well, the moment they do that, sure, it benefits the business or the industry of businesses uh, that they're lobbying, but it's going to cause a loser in, in maybe some opposite industry as well. And so this is all happening um, so that Congress can keep the shroud uh, in front of our eyes so we don't get to see uh, and we don't get to have any transparency around how they're ultimately spending all of our hard-earned tax dollars. We can't have that. We need total transparency um, and we need to bring Congress back to its intended form, which was represent the voices of the people, not their own self-interest and the wealthy corporations and special interests that are lobbying them. All right. And remember, they work for you. So vote. And vote for those who co-sponsor the fair tax uh, and who are willing to take a look at it at the very, very least. All right, so that's our special topic. We hope you enjoyed that. Um, a real important one. Uh, we've got to get away completely from an income tax system or any form of an income tax system. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to the questions, and there's a bunch of questions in here still. So uh, we, we're probably going to go over uh, the 9, nine o'clock mark by about five minutes, so if you can, stay with us. Uh, but we want to get through all these questions, so I'm going to go ahead and ask my colleague Larry to take himself off mute. And we are going to go through more of these questions and get your questions answered. All right. A number of people have written in, are you going to have a link to this webinar? Uh, absolutely. You can actually uh, respond to the email that invited you to this webinar or confirmed you, and we'll send you the PowerPoint presentation. And then you can also go to uh, the website in about a week, uh, the Florida Fair Tax Educational Association website, which is FF, F is in Frank, F is in Frank, TEA.com, FFTEA.com, um, will actually host a, a replay of the webinar as well. All right? A uh, question from Mr. Swift. Uh, J. David Swift has asked, has Linder, John Linder, retired from Congress? The answer is yes. John Linder was the original co-sponsor of the fair tax legislation. Um, his successor in his district is Rob Linder, and he has taken over reins oh, as being the main voice inside Congress um, and really pushing to get the fair tax heard and uh, talked about on, on the floor. All right. Um, another question from J. David Swift says, uh, I realize that AFFT, Americans for Fair Taxation, is nonpartisan, yet why? Yet most co-sponsors are Republicans, not Democrats. Why is the majority Republican House not all over the fair tax and supporting it? 
That's a great and interesting question, and I'm actually going to turn that over to Larry and see if you can take a stab at that, Larry. Sure. Uh, Mark, and Mark actually talked about it earlier. Uh, our biggest opposition is our Congress. They don't want to give up the power that they now have to manipulate the tax code for benefits to them from the lobbyists and other special interests. So that's, that's the main reason. And the second reason is that uh, people are just opposed to any kind of change. They're used to the income tax system. They're familiar with it. They don't want to make a change and go into something that they are totally unfamiliar with. So we've got those two forces that we are working against. That's why we know the only way we will get the fair tax passed is to have a strong grassroots uh, support organization with people like you and I and Mark who become knowledgeable in the fair tax and we're able to teach it to other people and build on that grassroots uh, strength. Our goal, if you don't already know it, is to have within each congressional district in the country 3,000 supporters for the fair tax. We know that we can change the outcome of any congressional election if we have the control of 3,000 votes. And that's why that goal is in place. Um, so uh, originally, uh, just to go back a moment, originally when this fair tax was put into uh, Congress for the first time, there was, it was actually a bipartisan entry. There were four Republicans and three Democrats who sponsored the bill the first time it was put into Congress. Uh, since then, Nancy Pelosi has admo admonished, admonished the Democratic caucus not to support the fair tax. If they did, they would not get support from her. And so we've only had uh, one Democrat supporter for the last couple of sessions in Congress, and that's, uh, uh, I forgot the congressman's name out in Oklahoma. And uh, he's not running for re he didn't run for re-election, so we're going to lose him this term. But uh, we just got to do more work, and we have to get into the districts where they are, have Democratic Congress purple, Congress representatives, congressional representatives, and convince them that uh, there are enough supporters who want the fair tax that if they don't support it, they're going to lose their seat. And it might go to another Democrat, it may go to a Republican. We don't care as long as we get a supporter. Mark. Yeah. Really good. Thanks, Larry. Uh, by the way, correction, uh, th and thank you, Don, for this. I said that John Linder's successor is Rob Linder. <laughs> That's not <laughs> true. It's Rob Woodall, uh, and he is the congressperson in uh, John Linder's district in Georgia who is um, taking up the flag and is waving that flag throughout Congress as best as he can. All right, question from Randy. Randy asks, how do you correlate the relation between how much revenue is currently collected annually under our current tax system versus the estimated revenue that will be generated under the fair tax plan? Uh, good question, Randy. The answer to that stems from uh, how the 23% was calculated. Now, I don't have the exact formula of how that was calculated, um, although you can go to fairtax.org and there's some interesting information there about that. Going back to Larry's point, $22 million of independent third-party research from some brilliant uh, global economists went into studying uh, the fair tax and helping to devise the formula uh, to come up with the 23 percent number. And so basically the 23 percent is multiplied times roughly our, our GDP. When you multiply that, then you achieve the revenue neutral amount of monies that Congress would collect. So that's a long answer to your question, but in its most simple form, the, you know, the whole basis of the $22 million research was, okay, if we were going to fund the government in another way, in a, in a revenue neutral way, um, what, and in this case, do it through a national sales tax, what would the percentage need to be? And uh, some brilliant economic minds uh, went into figuring that out. Larry, anything else on that? No, that pretty much covers it. It's really, uh, it's really pretty simple. You look at the gross domestic product, the GDP, and how much revenue was received under the income tax. And then uh, we find out what percentage we need of the GDP to create that with the sales tax. And 23% is 23% was the number. Mark? Yeah. 
Uh, Ken asked another good question. He said, how would the process work for collecting the fair tax in the current five or so states who don't already have a state sales tax? Uh, good question. Basically, how that would work simply, Kenneth, is that uh, the states that didn't would uh, kind of fall under the umbrella of a of a neighboring state. So there'd be in that transition year, they'd have to get that figured out. Um, but uh, I, I can't think off the top of my head which states don't have a sales tax, but um, they would basically partner up with a neighboring state and. Um, and that state sales tax bureau would be responsible for collecting from both. All right. Um, let's see. What happens, Paul? Hey, Paul, good to have you on. What happens to my disposable income? That's a really broad question, Paul, and I think you're leading me, which I appreciate, although I'm not exactly sure um, how you want me to answer that. Um, what I do know, as I've said vehemently throughout this presentation, is that your disposable income is going to dramatically increase. The average American's income is going to increase by 29%. You're going to have more disposable income than ever before um, in the history of the income tax. Anything else on that, Larry? No, but Paul, if you have some problem figuring out what to do with your disposable income, I'll take it. <laughs> Perfect. Um, all right. Uh, Lorna asked the question, don't you have to repeal the 16th Amendment? Yes, we do. Uh, absolutely we do. Uh, and it is written into the fair tax legislation that the 16th Amendment must be repealed otherwise o over a certain period of time. I believe it's, is it three years or seven years, Larry? That's seven years. Seven years. Yeah. Uh, seven years, and if not, then we have to go back and reintroduce the legislation. Uh, but that, that's that's a crucial part of the legislation because obviously we got to take away Congress's power to uh, tax our income. So the answer is yes. Yeah, I think uh, what she was getting at though is does it have to be does the Sixteenth Amendment have to be repealed before the uh, fair tax is implemented? The answer to that is no because of the fact that the legislation literally abolishes all of the income tax code, there is no longer anything for the IRS to enforce. So there, will not, there would not be an income tax and a sales tax simultaneously. The possibility is there that Congress could create a new income tax, and we could have both an income tax and a sales tax, but we have that scenario now. Congress could implement a sales tax without repealing the income tax, and we would have both. So it is an issue that is of concern, but because of the code being eliminated and then the IRS's budget being abolished, not only is there no code to enforce, but there's nobody to enforce the no code. Mark? Yeah, got it. Thanks, Larry. All right. Uh, Ken asks a, a good question. He says, how do we how do we effectively sell the fair tax program to those employees who quote unquote look forward to their tax refund every year after they file? You know, that not that isn't it amazing that we would have to sell that? Uh, that's the answer to your question, Ken, is education. Uh, for somebody who thinks that, who says, when somebody says, uh, did you have to pay any taxes this year? And they respond, no, I, I actually got taxes back. Uh, that is somebody who has been well conditioned by our government, by our politicians, uh, to think that they're getting a favor done by them uh, because they're clearly not thinking of the withholdings that come out of their paycheck every single month. Uh, so the, the broad answer to that question is education. The specific answer is we tell them and we show them <clears throat> that uh, they are going to be much further ahead and their disposable income is going to dramatically increase under the fair tax and that they get to keep 100% of their, their paycheck. Um, so that is going to equate to, so let's say, uh, well, here, let's do a little bit of math. 
let's say you make five grand a month and let's say roughly a thousand of it uh, gets withheld on every one of your paychecks each month. So your net pay is four. So over the course of the year, the government's taken 12 uh, and let's say that you, I don't know, maybe get a tax refund of about three grand. Well, the government's taken 12, you get back three. How about if they never took the 12 to begin with? You're plus nine. So how about under the fair tax, you put in this scenario $9,000 in your pocket. But that's literally the math that we have to do for people. We've got to educate them. All right. Um, let's see. I'm um, sorry, just going through some duplicates here. Um, it does seem like Warren Buffett or Ted Turner would be interested to invest in the nation's economy in this way. When I speak personally to congressmen, they quote unquote talk to the side in support of the fair tax. Why is that? Um, Sherry, I'm not sure what you mean, talk to the side. If you could specify that, or maybe Larry, you understand what she's, at, she's suggesting? No, no, I don't understand that question. Yeah, go ahead and rewrite that, Sherry, and we'll definitely get it answered. Um, um, a lot of people are asking for the chart, Larry, so I'm going to go ahead and give out your email if that's okay, so people can email you. Certainly. Certainly. Yeah, Larry's email is repeal underscore 16 at earthlink.net. Repeal underscore 16 at earthlink.net. All right. Um, let's see. Dusty wrote in, have all of the attendees go to the following website, www.theunfairtax.us. I don't know what that is. I've actually uh, never been there. Have you, Larry? Yes, I have a while back. Uh, it's an interesting site. It's not very positive. Got it. Oh, by the way, um, John... Thank you, John. Uh, Larry's email is repeal underscore the number 16, not 16 spelled out. Repeal underscore 16 at earthlink.net. Um, okay, question from Don. Can you go over if I would, if we would still have state sales tax taken out of our paycheck? Why would a, how would a sales tax be taken out of a paycheck? Correct. So the answer, Don, is a, a sales tax is not taken out of a paycheck. Perhaps you meant would a state income tax be taken out of your paycheck? Uh, the answer is yes. The fair tax is the is the federal retail sa uh, federal retail sales tax, um, and is independent of any states that impose currently a state income tax. Uh, it's, however, it is very likely that if the, the country and federally we go the route of eliminating an income tax and replacing it with just a sales tax, that it's likely that most states would follow suit. They would eliminate their own state income taxes and replace that revenue with a state sales tax. All right. Um, Yep, got that. Uh, Republican House has the power to move HR 25 out of House Ways and Means Committee. Um, are we pressuring them to do so now? I don't know. We are not doing that in a formal way as we speak, but there is a plan underway to do exactly that, and uh, we will be addressing the congressional representatives independently in each state uh, who are members of the Ways and Means Committee and talking to them about the fair tax, getting them to understand better what the fair tax really does, how it works, 
and hopefully uh, getting a positive response from them and support. Uh, to answer your question, no, but that's in the works and that should be happening very shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, Sherry wrote back in to clarify her question when she said, uh, speak to the side. What she meant is a Congress person will not publicly speak in support of the fair tax in her experience only privately. So in other words, they'll tell their, their private constituents, yeah, sure, I support it, but publicly they won't do it. I mean, that's a really great point, Sherry. There's, there's a number of uh, congressmen and women out there that will simply pay lip service to it you know, tell the, the, the broad fair tax base that's in their district or in their state what they want to hear, that yes, they support it, but in actuality, they're, they're not going to really do anything about it. They're just telling you that to win your vote. Imagine a politician doing that. You know, one of the things you want to check at when you're voting is uh, if somebody suggests that they are a proponent of the fair tax, go to their website, look at their printed material. If they have the fair tax listed on their website that they supported, if it's in their printed material, then you know there's somebody that's serious about it. Otherwise, they're just paying you lip service. You should pass on them. I thank you for clarifying. Um, John says, regarding the $22 million in research, that research included all the income tax paid by workers as part of the embedded tax. Most agree those taxes would be returned to the worker who would get the entire amount re-earned. Got it. Um, sorry, just going through, there's a couple more questions that are duplicates and there's some comments. We're just winding down here. Okay, so oh, I misspoke uh, earlier about where you can go to um, find a recorded version of this hosted webinar. I misspoke. Uh, the, the website, the Florida Fair Tax website is flfairtax.org. flfairtax.org, not fftea.com. Sorry about that, and thank you, Ron. appreciate that. So flfairtax.org, give us about a week and we'll get this recording up there and um, you can listen to it to your heart's content. Uh, why aren't, from Randy, why aren't more high profile folks and businesses more publicly supporting this in the media and elsewhere when they have as much or more to gain than the average American? Larry, you want to take that? Uh, I wish I could answer that question. I don't know how they think. The only, the only conclusion I can come to is that right now they understand the income tax system, they understand the benefits that they are able to take through their lobbyists or what have you, and there's no sense in making any waves because they know they're getting tax breaks that other people are not. Uh, when the fair tax is implemented, businesses are going to be a lot better off. Why they don't understand that, I'm not sure. A personal experience I had with a company I worked with when I talked to the chief financial officer about the fair tax, I'm, I'm thinking about his dumb answer afterward, is if the fair tax were implemented, this individual would not have the value to the company that he does today being knowledgeable in the income tax system. And so he may just be protecting his job or think he's protecting his job. Uh, so it's, it doesn't really answer your question, it just gives you a couple of thoughts on why that might be the case. Mark? Yeah. Um, interesting comment from Kenneth who says, uh, your current point number seven, why Congress wants to keep the income tax, look what power they've given to the IRS in Obamacare. 16,000 new IRS agents to police it. That's something to think about. Uh, let's see. Okay, we talked about how to get a copy of this. So, Dusty, hopefully that answers your question. Go to flfairtax.org. Uh, Richard wrote in, why not have a startup by 5% fair tax and then see how it can work, not just go cold turkey 
uh, 23 percent fair tax. You know that what you're suggesting is you know can we sort of dip our toe in the water? The problem with that, Richard, is that the moment we create a scenario for Congress where we have both an income tax and a sales tax, uh, they're going to really like that. And if, if we don't create the legislation that enforces the repeal of the 16th Amendment to um, get rid of the income tax or Congress, Congress's power to levy an income tax, they're going to really like the fact that they've got this brand new revenue stream and it might be even harder to then get them to go cold turkey. And it's really reminiscent of Kane's, Herman Cain's 999 program that you maybe heard about um, during the Republican primaries. He wanted to do a 9% flat income tax, personal income tax, 9% flat business income tax, and then 9% sales tax federally, and then jump to the fair tax. And again, for the same reason, um, if you give Congress the opportunity to have both an income tax and a sales tax, I think we're putting ourselves in hot water. Um, and we can't just do 5% because sales tax across the board, because that's obviously not enough revenue to fund the federal government. So it's just a very risky proposition to give Congress the power to levy both an income tax and the sales tax at the same time. And that also means that we would have to be able to support uh, administering an income tax as well as the sales tax simultaneously, and that becomes a nightmare. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, well that does it. That we've, we've, oh, we've exhausted all the questions and uh, just about all of you have stayed with us, so we thank you. We've gone 15 minutes over here. Um, I want to thank my colleague Larry. Uh, who is always is a wealth of information. Uh, I want to thank the regulars who came on, especially John, uh, who made some great comments, and thank you everyone else who corrected my mistakes. Um, we hope you got a lot of value out of this, and our challenge to you is to come back next month, or actually, we, we're not going to have one uh, in December at this point because of the Christmas holiday, but come back in January and bring somebody that hasn't heard this presentation before. Uh, and then also go to fairtax.org and sign up and, and give some money to the, to the, to the cause. And then also uh, there's a place right in on that website where you can contact your congressman or woman easily uh, and let them know that you support the fair tax. You want them to support it. You want them to co-sponsor it. And if they don't, they're, you're, they're not going to get your vote for the next election. So we thank you for taking the time. We wish you a great evening, a great week, and get out there and talk to everyone you know about the fair tax uh, and bring them to this webinar in January. Have a great night, everyone.